Hi everyone, happy Global Meetings Industry Day. I'm Suzanne Mulligan, the Senior Community Engagement Manager at IMEX Group, and I'm here today with our CEO, Karina Bauer. Karina, tell me a little bit about the first week in March. Events were beginning to cancel, but I don't think the world realized what was about to happen. What did it feel like in the IMEX office? Well, to be honest, uh, the first week of March felt pretty normal in the IMEX office. Um, as you say, um, things had just started to turn really in the first week of March. But I think it's fair to say that all of us, certainly myself and, and the world really, the Western world had underestimated um, the coronavirus as a disease. And we'd also totally underestimated the impact that it was going to have on our world. And I don't think we could comprehend at that point the speed that that impact would have. So in the first week of March, you know, it was a normal week in the office. We were busy. We were planning for IMEX in Frankfurt. We could see things happening around the world. And I think what we were trying to do in that first week of March was really um, deliver confidence uh, to our team, deliver confidence to the industry that actually IMEX was 10 weeks away. And it was incomprehensible at that point that in 10 weeks, we would be in a situation where the show wouldn't be able to carry on. So right at the beginning of March, although we'd had some big cancellations like ITV in Berlin and Mobile World Congress, we felt that we still had sufficient time uh, to sort of push through this crisis, which would be in March, um, and then plan forward to IMEX in Frankfurt in May. So that was where we were kind of on the 3rd of March, if you like. And then sort of things started to, to really ramp up and the world was changing at a really fast pace. So, so how did you sort of deal with that within both your leadership team and then the rest of the, the office? Yeah, so I think what was extraordinary is how quickly that situation changed. So on the, for Monday, the 3rd of March, that was the situation. By the Thursday or Friday of that week, we realized that we didn't have weeks to really look at what, how the situation might pan out. We had a matter of days and things were changing so fast and cancellations were coming in so fast. And it wasn't just that the cancellations were happening, but it was becoming apparent that this was a much bigger issue in terms of the health crisis and the safety of your participants and your team and your family than we under, had understood before. And that the length of this was going to be very different and that it was was really happening that Europe and the Western world were going to go into lockdown. Um, and so the situation was so fluid and it changed so quickly. You know, for us as a team, we started to talk very quickly to all our suppliers and our exhibitors. What we wanted to understand was how long did we have to make decisions before they started expending money that they wouldn't be able to recoup. So we had gone to them and said, we'll refund you 100% of your stand space. But that's nice, but it's kind of incidental if what you spend on the show is five, six times as much because of everything else that you do around it. And so we realized very quickly that we had to make decisions much, much sooner than we had really understood. And that's, you know, us having done nearly 20 shows, we still had to sort of really think about that ecosystem and that whole supply chain and the timelines in a way that we hadn't really thought about before. Um, you know, as you know, Suzanne, we had um, a crisis communications plan in place already, but that crisis communications plan was set up for really dealing with issues that happened on site or just before the show that might lead to problems at the show, reductions in people being able to attend, perhaps even the risk of cancellation. But it was so far removed from the situation that we were dealing with. But we had it in place and we'd worked on it over the past year. We put the whole team through training just 18 months ago around it. We developed new protocols as a result of that and beefed it up. And so we were able to lean back on that, which was so valuable at that time because we weren't making things up from scratch. Um, and right from the beginning of February, we've been calling uh, weekly meetings with the leadership team around this. Um, and so we quickly 
did daily meetings and then that formed into two, twice daily meetings and we also started to call the full team together um, that second week of March and we were calling them together you know twice daily as well because I wanted them to understand how we were thinking what was going on what we were discussing uh, because in a small office like ours you know you can't keep those things away from people they know something's going on so we felt it was really really important to keep everybody um, up to speed and be as transparent as we possibly could around our thinking and and this fluid situation that was changing practically every half an hour. No, I know. And I, I remember, you know, how it felt those weeks. Um, you know, it was a little bit, or days even, not even weeks. Um, but I know then, you know, you had to make the really difficult decision to, to cancel IMEX in Frankfurt for this year. Um, and I know we've sent a lot of communication around about that. Um, I know for myself and many of the team, canceling it actually felt like a real loss for, for us. You know, we're a small team, as you said, and we plan two shows a year. So to lose one and to lose sort of our you know, our pinnacle show, the one that's been around for almost 20 years was was a real sense of loss for all of us. So how did you and the team manage the mental health of the staff during that period and, and kind of ongoing? Yeah, I mean, it's really bizarre that, you know, canceling an event feels like a grieving in a way. And at this time when people are suffering health problems, they're losing loved ones and uh, they're losing jobs, it, it almost feels like a luxury to even be able to say that. And it feels wrong in some ways. But that is how it feels. It's hard to um, hard to pretend otherwise. You know, you do grieve that loss, and you do because you know you put your heart and soul into. Uh, we certainly put our hearts and souls into Frankfurt um, and and IMEX America, um, and people in our industry do put their hearts and souls souls into the shows and the events that they run. So that's how it feels. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is we were very transparent. I was emotional in front of the team i feel emotional just talking about it now um and we allowed ourselves that time to be emotional um, i think together and we also brought joy into it as well you know we did laugh together and we cried together and um you know at the end of that week you know we sort of down tools early and we brought in beers and we just allowed ourselves those moments so i think that was important I think the really difficult thing was the fact that the country was going into lockdown immediately afterwards. And so we went from that and at least being together, if nothing else, to suddenly being apart in our um, own spaces and in our own homes and having to deal with that. So the mental health aspect has been and did become very important. Um, we have a 24-7 um, hotline that we already had in place for staff, so they were able to lean on that. But I think, you know, you and I, Suzanne, obviously got on the phone very quickly because we do have an amazing engagement program that you've put together over the past 18 months. And that's been so helpful for the team. And we were able to shift that very quickly to a remote sort of virtual space. So we were able to offer staff um, help from a sort of very formal mental health um, program but we were also able to keep doing things like our spin the wheel where you know staff give each other recognition and then we get them you know vouchers and they could get that delivered um, the idea that you came up with a spread some sunshine where we're sending letterbox flowers um, to a few people each week has had an amazing impact um, organizing buddy systems for people um, across the company so not just within their teams and then you know things like Ray calling um, up all members of the team we know that's had a great impact so I, I think it's just about you know we've really thought hard haven't we about how to still engage and keep staff connected even when they are physically apart and um, you know the happy hours that we're doing remotely uh, we have one today but you know last week pets on parade you know that was so well received with everybody you know showing the tricks their pets could do and things like that it just brings some I suppose what we've talked about is bringing joyful moments to people and that um, I think has helped people as much as we can uh, we've, we've been doing. I think that's so true. And I think that one of the really important things and, and hopefully a takeaway that people can get from this is that, you know, to continue to virtually engage, you actually don't have to spend a lot of money. So, you know, while we have made a decision to take some of our um, engagement 
budget that we would have spent in the office and put it towards doing letterbox flowers and things like that. The large majority of what we're trying to do for engagement is free. It's just setting up the virtual happy hours with the theme, our pets on parade, which was an animal show or people and children dressed as animals, you know, and just general checking in with each other. I think that of the buddy system has been really helpful, but I also think, you know, having our chairman Ray calling the staff members and just having a chat with them really has gone gone very far. You know, I got my call last week and it, it absolutely made the meant the world to me. So I think that, you know, a real takeaway from this is that it doesn't need to be a massive budget that people are putting behind this. It's just about connecting, right? And that's what we in our industry do do the best is face to face. And you know, this isn't my dream face to face. I'd much rather be sitting with you having this conversation, but to be able to do it like this, I think does still make a big difference to people. Um, so with that, we also obviously had to make the transition to 100% of our office working from home. And we had sort of started a bit more flexible work in the last year and, and most team members have worked from home. But, you know, was there anything that you had to overcome to move our entire offices it to 100% work from home or anything that was in place that did make that transition easier? Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting, really, that um, we had started to put in place the building blocks to enable more flexible working. And that was sort of the direction we were going. So we were very lucky that I think everybody, by the time this happened, had just had been given a laptop. So even our office management team or accounts team who would normally be in the office had laptops. So that was great. We were also in the middle of rolling out Office 365, but that was supposed to take another three to five months. So we we did that in three days. Um, and so we had the building blocks in place, but I think you know the training for people, making sure people got up to speed on Office 365, was able to use Teams, go to meeting that we're using today. We had a license for doing webinars, but to roll that out for the whole team. There were just a lot of little things that the event tech team had to put in place extraordinarily quickly. And also, I think it was just getting people comfortable with it as well. So if you generally work from home regularly, you know, you're pretty comfortable, you've got your workstation set up, it's easy. But if you're somebody who's never worked from home except for two hours because they're waiting for their electrician to come, you know, it's a whole different ball game because you're not set up to work 100% from home and just getting people to check their internet connections were going to work. Um, so there was a huge amount that we had to do uh, as part of that um, that sort of crisis communications plan. We also set up a separate um, raid log for um, the working from home aspect. And I think we had about 150 items because we sat there and we just said, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to make this decision. So we end up with this massive list and within like a few days, it was down sort of 10 items because we've done so many things. But it was about sort of putting it all on the table and then different people taking different things. We were also lucky we're able to do a practice day of, as well. So just get people comfortable and then they could come back into the office, talk about that talk to the team about their problems and then um, spend a couple of days doing that before we actually had to be at home. So I think we were in a lucky place to have um, have put a lot of those building blocks in place already. Definitely, definitely. And I think one of the things that um, we've, we've also heard a lot from the team um, was the flexibility was so important to them that we've been able to give. And, you know, I had said earlier, we'd already sort of moved towards a flexible working where we can work sort of different hours during the day, which has been incredible. Um, but to offer that to everybody now more than ever, I think was important. And I think to continue to remind the team that we just want them to get their work done. And if it has to be done in some funny hours, some days because of, you know, child commitments or just family commitments or just because their mental health is is making them struggle to do something on a specific day. I think that's been a really massive help to people to just kind of make sure you're communicating that flexible plan over and over and over again. Um, yes, I mean, I think that's what's been interesting is just you can never communicate things like that too much. But I think for us, what we've just tried to look at is what can we do that's realistic and reasonable for the team? You know, this isn't normal 
circumstances. There will be days and weeks where people are not going to be as productive because they need to stand in the line for a grocery store for three hours. I mean, that's just our new reality. So we think we've just really tried hard through the leadership team into the teams and then as a business as well to just remind people it's okay. Take some time, get used to the new reality, do what you need to do, and we'll communicate with you, you communicate with us. And that's really been the key to it, just saying, you know, we trust you. So so it's OK, you know, and you trust us by telling us what's going on in your world and in your life. And then we can help you with it. And, and I think that's just our aim, really, just helping everybody to navigate this new normal for as long as it lasts. I agree completely. Um, you know, one of the things that we did as a team, we started about a year ago now, was we work with CultureAmp to do surveys on engagement with the company. And they had rolled out um, a COVID-19 response survey, which we decided to launch about two weeks ago to the team, um, just sort of giving them a place to say what was making them concerned or what had gone really well and ask some questions. Um, and we ended up doing that great town hall afterwards where you and I sat and I asked you all of the questions. And I think that that sort of showing that trust, showing that openness and showing that communication to the team has made a massive difference in their safety and security because people are afraid. This is a health crisis and people are afraid for their for their lives, for their jobs. Um, so I think another takeaway, you know, for anybody who's watching is that A, communication, but B, ask your team what's concerning them and then allow somebody like your CEO to answer those questions. And, you know, I commend you because we, we asked some hard questions that day and you had to be really honest with everybody. So how did that feel for you? It felt really good, in all honesty. Um, we tackled every question, big and small, that came in. And there were some really hard questions in there, as you say. But it felt really good because I knew that uh, we were being honest and transparent with the team. Um, it was interesting, wasn't it? Because, um, you know, with issues like flexibility, we realized from that survey that about 50% of the team had heard what we'd said and 50% hadn't. So it was really really valuable because otherwise you say well I've said that five times so why do I need to say it again um but it was great I got you know we got such great feedback after that for that honesty and transparency and I don't I think what it teaches us really um, especially as leaders is that you know to trust your team to hear the difficult parts of the conversations. You know, it's not that people don't want to hear the difficult um, things. They want to hear everything. What they don't want is to be in a state of flux and not knowing because then they assume the worst. And so I think that's really, really important just not to shy away from giving those honest answers um, to people so that they can plan their lives and, and plan with their families and have those conversations and then ask their follow-up questions. I think that's what, I think we knew that already, we did that already, but if this has taught me anything, it's to really trust that. Um, and I think that we have done that so far and, and so far I think our team spirit has been amazing. I agree. I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, in January, we launched our yearly culture amp survey talking about engagement. And, you know, I think that actually is our team spirit. Um, and we were really proud to have an 85% positive um, engagement rate among, amongst the team. Um, we've talked a little bit about some of the engagement programs that we put into place, but I, I did want to add a couple because I think, um, you know, we had we had started some workshops within the office uh, that were going to be rolled out in person um, around performance and and presentation skills and things like that. Um, and another idea that people could do is to bring those online. So we were lucky enough to have Faye Sharp talk to the team on Monday about mentoring. We have Patrick Delaney joining us next week to talk about networking. Um, what are some other uh, kind of ideas? I know we've got the Q&A. Would you talk a little bit about other, again, free ways that people can bring more to their teams to keep them engaged and keep them connected to the industry? Yeah, so one of the things that we are also doing is the Q&As with myself and Ray and other industry leaders. So every two weeks, um, we're doing those Q&As. It's not obligatory, but it's open to everybody. And um, every two weeks, I'm picking a different sort of sector of the industry to talk about, because of course, we've got 60 people and people tend to work on, um, you know, the elements of the business events industry that really um, their clients are 
are working on. So they may not um, have the broad scope that some of us do if we're working cross industry. And so today I'm going to be talking about uh, trade association bias and the types of events that association uh, congresses and conventions, what they are, why that's important to our clients, the kind of direct economic and indirect legacy benefits of those events. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about incentive travel and the special role that DMCs have in the incentive travel industry and the special role that DMCs play as stand partners at IMEX and got Porrick Gilligan uh, joining me for that. So yeah, we just, I think one of the things that we've been able to do is not just with the sort of fun engagement activities, but also with the training activities is just pivot quickly to having those online and there's no reason that you can't do those things online. It, it's not quite as good, um, but it still it still can be done. And I think people loved having Faye just for 10, 15 minutes on Monday morning. She gave them sort of the impetus to write down 20 goals for 2020. Lots of people have been telling me that they've already achieved their goal for this week. So, you know, I think it's really important as well to get people talking to other people in the industry and bring them into our world and I, I guess really use this time wisely um, we always try to do that um, as a business and I think now more than ever um, just use this time wisely to upskill and to do those things that we never have time for right yeah well so I've seen on Facebook that you are relearning how to play the piano and you've yes. also been keeping up with your running so do you have any sort of tips or tricks for people who are working from home yeah, so I have been, um, I haven't been exercising every day, but I've been trying to do something, whether it's um, sort of fitness or yoga or um, something like music. So in January, actually, I was at the Site Global Conference and we had to sit after a keynote and say what our goals were and what we wanted to achieve this year. And I said to Porrick Gilligan, who was sitting next to me, um, I really want to relearn the piano, but I just don't have time and I don't can never seem to make time so anyway I'm relearning the piano and as you know Suzanne for you I am trying to relearn I dreamed a dream from Les Mis and it's coming on and I'm also <laughs> doing uh, 1000 years which we're going to try and do as an IMEX team band thing um so it's been fantastic actually I've really enjoyed it um so yeah so I'm doing that and I'm running and I'm doing yoga and I'm not great at any of those three things but I I'm really enjoying doing them and it, it allows me to just take some time out and obviously with the running to get out of the house which I think is really really valuable you know to just get some fresh air and see something different I, I can't recommend that enough and I also found that um, in that very stressful period of March where we were trying to make the decision of what would happen with IMEX in Frankfurt and then the decision to cancel there, there was just so much going on in my head uh, running was a real uh, inspiration and I am I am not a runner people <laughs> uh, but I really found it so um, valuable um, and it just really allowed me to process um, those thoughts and emotions. Oh, I think that's so important and I think that you know whatever that sort of outdoor exercise looks like for people it's so important to sort of carve that time out of your day you know that you just have a minute to yourself um, especially people who have families or or a lot of people in the house um, but it's just as important for people who are by themselves currently quarantined or self-isolating um, so I think just making sure you get that that sort of headspace that's separate from work uh, it's really really important to remember so we have been quite busy in the IMEX office, even though we don't have IMEX in Frankfurt to look forward to. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the virtual event, event that IMEX is planning? Yes, so as soon as we canceled or within a few days, we gathered a team to start putting together a virtual something. And I think we very quickly were able to work out what our objectives would be for that. So first, we could see that there was a plethora of fantastic virtual um, events and education out there um, from trade associations, from the trade publications, and also, you know, great organizations outside of the industry industry as well. Um, so we really uh, try to focus on what would be unique to IMEX um, so that we're not just repeating what's already out there, uh, which is, you know, very high quality already. So we wanted to look at what would be unique to us, what would really bring connection 
um, to our community. That's so important. Um, it, with the loss of an event like IMIX in Frankfurt, we want to try to help people to still connect in a business sense, in an educational sense, and for networking. And then also, you know, we were very clear very quickly that whatever we did, we wanted to be a gift to the industry. Um, so we kind of um, did a lot of virtual brainstormings um, to sort of just narrow down that list of ideas against those three key objectives. And um, yeah, very excited that we have um, a great team. I mean, out of 60 of us, I think 40 people are working on this. And uh, it's not an event. It will be a virtual experience. It's going to go over um, the course of a number of weeks. And we really have um, focused on trying to put together some joyful elements, some fun elements, some interactive elements, some on-demand elements, uh, educational content, but also looking at the business opportunities. And if there are business opportunities out there, how we can deliver those in the market. So I won't say too much about it because I don't want to seal the thunder of the marketing uh, plans that we've got um, coming. But I will just say that uh, we're calling it Planet Inex. It is a virtual experience. We're going to be um, launching the concept of it during April, but the official start of that experience will come at the beginning of May and run through May and June. So that's all I'll say for now in terms of uh, what it is. But I think, you know, as you can see, you know, I think I'm, I'm really excited about it because, and I think it shows that team connectedness, the team spirit that we have, that we've been able to pivot so very quickly into thinking about something positive for the future and for the industry. And our team really wants to give something back to the industry in replacement for what we couldn't deliver in May in Frankfurt. I, I can't wait to see it myself. I'm really excited to take part in it. So. So other than obviously IMAX, um, vir our virtual IMAX plan at IMAX, what do you think we can look forward to this year, uh, you know, for the industry, for, for I, it has to get better, right? So what, what are we going to look forward to? What are you going to look forward to? Well, obviously, very much hoping uh, that IMAX America is going to be a great coming together for the industry. So uh, we as a team, of course, and I think the industry as well, is really looking forward to IMAX America and having everybody together again. Um, and of course, we're very busy um, working on that as well. Um, cognizant, of course, of the huge um, difficulties that our industry are in right now. And so I think the other thing that we just need to be very aware of as an industry is how we can support each other. And I think if there's anything to look forward to, it is the fact that we know this will be over one day. But the question for all of us is how long will that take and what will that recovery look like? Um, I very strongly believe that there's going to be massive paint up demand for meeting face to face, for business events face to face and for travel as well. But that demand can only be realized once we have the certainty from the governments that we can travel, that we can attend mass events, um, because our industry has a lead time. You know, we need that certainty for a number of months before we can plan forward. So I think, you know, knowing that I'm very optimistic about the medium and long term future of our industry. But in the short term, we really need to do everything that we can to support each other. The more we can help each other, the more of us are going to come out of this in a healthy position. And I don't just mean healthy physically, but I mean financially healthy and able to continue working and to ramp up quickly. Because I think that's the other thing. Once business gets back to normal, we as an industry are going to have to ramp up incredibly quickly. So, you know, with that, let's support each other. Let's support our suppliers. Let's support the freelancers and contractors and the little people and the big people, because we really do need each other for when we need to get back. You know, already, if you look at the diary for Q4, and let's hope that can all happen, Q4 is going to be the busier than we can even imagine. So I know people are already saying, how do we even deliver this as an industry? So let's make sure that we can deliver it and really um, support our clients. And therefore, we need to support each other. So that's the biggest thing I would say. I am optimistic about the future. We don't know how long this will last. But in the meantime, let's try and help as many of us to survive as possible. 
Wise words, Karina. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to spend this time with you. And uh, we hope everybody has a wonderful Global Meetings Industry Day. Absolutely. Happy Global Meetings Industry Day. And we look forward to seeing you in person soon.